Hello and welcome to another episode of the Less Matters Trainer Interviews. Today we are joined by Victor Gurgic. Victor is a very long-standing large-scale scrum trainer. He's got a ton of experience. You're going to really enjoy what he has to say. I can pretty much guarantee that. As is normal on these episodes, I will not give an introduction myself of the person because they know much more about themselves than I could ever summarize. So Victor, would you like to tell our listeners a little bit more about yourself? Sure. Um, I am originally from Bosnia, um, ended up in Netherlands, and I started writing code, I think, when I was about, about 14 years old. And um, ended up um, when I ended up in Netherlands, I obviously computer science and stuff and uh, different customers. And I was for a long time very frustrated uh, uh, about uh, product development, uh, which we can talk about it later. This kind of uh, stuff, and um, and eventually ended up um, uh, with uh, as a software developer for a long time, uh, getting uh, to know um, Scrum and uh, XP, etc and um, encountered all kinds of issues regarding um, how to organize many teams. And I've been experimenting with that for quite a few years and um, lived in Netherlands, worked in Netherlands for 20 years and now in Hong Kong and for eight years. So um, that's in, basically in short. Now, one thing that always seems to come up when I talk to people on the podcast, at least so far, is that a lot of them were programmers in the previous life, or, or at least still are programmers now. I feel like I need to scratch an, a nerdy itch and ask you which languages did you enjoy <laughs> working with? Yeah, unfortunately, my languages were, weren't that nerdy. So it was Java for our longest period of time, <laughs> and which is, uh, I believe, it's still the number one language, at least the most um, kind of a, the, the mature, I think. And so the... Um, that had been for a long time. Before that, actually, it was Pascal, which I liked I liked actually a lot. And it was a bit of a C and uh, just also C++, but I didn't like it. Uh, it just uh, it hurts my brain to understand how it works. And um, and uh, But nowadays I'm playing with uh, Go and, uh, uh, and Rust, but it's more on a learning level. It's not really doing anything serious. You're not trying to make a living from being uh, Rust? Developer. I would actually uh, secretly I would love to. So, but yeah, I don't know. It's a. It's kind of like. A, and now I'm mainly busy with the with the with this typical thing, and as you also, uh, how to make product development more pleasant, and uh, which unfortunately um, involves much more organizational stuff and less uh, and a bit less, uh, not enough uh, coding stuff. So yeah. Yeah, organizational cultures I found are harder to compile. You get far <laughs> many more syntax errors. <laughs> Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, I'd love to talk about the popular, how popular Java is and how you find it in pretty much seems to be anything you ever buy from anywhere, um, perhaps. But let's move on from there. Thank you very much, Victor. Um, are you still, or have you, you're part of Odd E? Yeah, I'm still part of Odd E. Yeah. So in, um, yeah. And I'm, I'm just curious because we've spoken to Terry, we've spoken to Boz. Perhaps I'll work my way around the company over the next couple of years. But it'd be interesting to hear a little bit more about your experience working so it's under, well, not under Boz, because that isn't the case, is it, with Oddy? You don't really work for Boz. No, no, no. No, it's a. Um, um, it's it's a bit an unusual the way we work. Uh, so um, the popularly outside is called holacracy, I believe, but we it's actually not that. So it's uh, so quite often compared to that, but it's not. We simply don't have rules. And uh, if you can would explain that in a short as possible way, well, almost um, there is a kind of like an implicit rule which proved to be over time uh, quite important to all of us, which is uh, being a team player, so part of a team. And so, um, uh, but that's about it. And everything else seems to be kind of like just the guidelines. And so we don't really know, actually. Um, we don't have some kind of a, a vision about uh, this is uh, how the company is going to look like in some time. There is no such thing. 
with just basically having a good time. Uh, and uh, there are no managers, nobody's reporting to anybody. And everybody decides how they work, how much they work, what they're working on. And, um, and we do share a lot with each other. So this is um, how it works currently. Yeah. It must be quite rewarding for the for you and for the other people involved then having that degree of autonomy. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. So it's a kind of like a, it, it makes you um, experience um, what it does to you when you have such a level of autonomy and, um, and uh, what happens to your motivation, what happens to a sense of responsibility. And um, so I believe that um, uh, there's a certain gradation. Obviously, um, um, I haven't encountered any other company which has such a level of autonomy as we have. And also such a level of uh, of a shared responsibility, but uh, in other companies and to connect to less, um, uh, when you see that there is a, at least an improvement from uh, no sense of uh, autonomy and no sense of a shared responsibility, then um, you know there is a clear difference in the motivation. So there is a direct relationship. There seems to be a quite a strong relationship between if you have a high sense of um, responsibility and autonomy then uh, motivation also goes up and um yeah and i suppose there has to be an, a degree of alignment and i will turn this towards less because i think that what I, I one of my running theories at the moment is that one of the mistakes that people make when they're trying to scale agile or they look at something like safe or they misunderstand scrum is that they will give too much empowerment and autonomy at the team level. So you have team level product ownership. So you end up with lots of small little speedboats all going off in different directions because they don't provide that alignment. And there's and there's too much empowerment and too much autonomy. So, so I think what, what Les has done really well is create a high degree of alignment and purpose, giving teams a strong degree of autonomy and empowerment but not so much that you end up just going off in different directions. And at, at, at ODE, do you get you've got good alignment then on what you're trying to achieve? Well, that's at that point, the comparison kind of breaks down because we are not really as a company delivering a product. And um, uh, so each team has a focuses on uh, on their own city or or own country so uh, which means that uh, in between um, uh, teams uh, there is not something which we have a op in operational sense that we deliver together or not much uh, there is a little bit but it's not really the main objective main objective is helping other companies with product development and so which is mean which means that we don't do not from day to day share the same objective and so this this makes in that sense is comparison is really difficult um uh so but the, nevertheless um it's um the the the, the part where comparison doesn't break down is um is um as a team um or in general sense whether it's a one team or many teams having a um a clarity of what you want to achieve and um and um and also uh feeling that this is actually something that you participate in, own it together with the other teams. And uh, that proves to be uh, the, the key missing part in, um, in the complex product development with many teams. That, uh, and hence the teams don't have much of a choice, so they kind of like a resort to uh, having their own uh, separate goals. In other words, this own separate speedboats, as you explained. Uh, where each of them try to figure out something they uh, can influence and can own because uh, owning something together with other teams is just too hard. Without wanting to spend the next 30 minutes talking about all of these topics, because I now yeah. feel that there's a nice segue into talking about the um, about sharing. And was mm -hmm. it uh, governing the commons, Linda Ostrom, which is effectively about yeah. humans and inability to successfully share a limited resource? I think uh, yeah. without wanting to go into those topics, maybe that's another podcast for another day. I want to move on and go through some of these standard less trainer questions that I've been asking everyone. And I want I want you to imagine, Victor, I want you to imagine that 
you've walked into the a huge office building that's the company of your dreams, the one you've always really wanted to work with. For some reason, you know, you were just there, just kind of just thought you'd pop in and you've ended up in an elevator with the CEO of this company. Yeah. And you've got until he gets off and in his beautiful kind of penthouse executive suite, you've got like 50 floors to convince him that like less um, is or is. <laughs> as history has proven, perhaps, is not the framework for him. What would be your elevator pitch? Yeah. So it's a, for me, the, the elevator thing is uh, easy to imagine in Hong Kong. I'm living on 66 floors, so that's going to... Uh, gonna uh, I can give myself a bit, a, bit, a bit more time to explain. And so um, the key thing and the... The, and the key difference between comp all the different companies which uh, inspire agility, uh, so that's the kind of like the business we are in, uh, because the companies say we want agility. Um, and the key difference between companies which have a, 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 a actual tangible benefit from it and which don't um, is in the, um, the structure, in the complexity of organizations. And uh, um, most approaches... Um, uh, they are actually addressing the practices, um, and which are really good uh, quite often, not always in other approaches. Uh, what makes less uh, special, what makes less different from other approaches is that um, the key objective is the organization itself. And that's it needs to be much simpler. So organization which has a more agility um, uh, tends to be also much, uh, to be much simpler. So I haven't seen a complex organization which are lots of structure, lots of layers, lots of roles which has um, agility. So if you want to have agility, less can help to uh, help you in a simplifying organization. So the approach is on the organizational level, and not only to introduce all kinds of cool practices. And so if you address the organization, which is tends to be much more painful and much more difficult, then the chance of having a real agility is higher. Insert round of applause here. That, that's, a, that's a note for myself. So in the edit, I can, I can put in a round of applause. Um, <laughs> or, or I might just let people imagine what a round of applause sounds like. Yeah. When we say organization, Victor, I think it's worthwhile spending a moment clarifying for those that perhaps haven't been on a certified less practitioner course or have got to kind of spend some time with you perhaps or work in a less adoption. What do we mean when we say organization? Are we talking about product and tech? Are we talking about the whole organization, like finance through to marketing? Like what do you, when you say organization, what does that encompass? Yeah, it's a, a product development part of organization. So that depends on type of organization, could be almost the entire organization or not really, so a limited part. And so um, um, it's the, the part which develops and delivers the product to the customer, end customer. And uh, so everything that is required in order to accomplish that. So that could be marketing, that could be all kinds of things. Um, uh, let's say finance of HR, not really. They are basically supportive to that product development organization, to give a more concrete example. And um, so um, um, typically in the companies which are uh, uh, real product development organization, this means almost the entire organization. But uh, let's say a bank um, might not be. Like um, uh, both of uh, us have uh, quite a lot of experience in a banking world, uh, corporate investment banking, I suspect, if I'm not wrong. And so then... Uh, you will have there um, the, the business side and the business side generally doesn't really get uh, transformed uh, in, in this change and uh, doesn't get much impact that it's the IT side. And um, uh, nevertheless, uh, the business side needs to, uh, does needs to understand what the change is all about and is part of this change. And uh, it just doesn't need to, the business side doesn't get changed that much. So I don't know if, um, uh, considering that you are very experienced with this, I'm actually curious about how you actually uh, would explain that in a banking world. Oh, in banking, it's brilliantly terrible. I tried to use a positive word and a negative word. I always found it relatively straightforward to build a, a bubble of less or agile anything in, in, a, in a large organization, like such as a bank, particularly complex organizations like banking, and I know that 
we had um, Ahmad on one of the earlier podcasts as well, and he's got a huge degree of experience working in banking. And I know that at least he shared the same opinion that me, that banks had so much money for so long, they didn't have to really care about how complex, first of all, the software architecture became, or the fact that their software quality was in the doldrums. It didn't matter. They could just chuck chuck more money at it, decide to build another version of the same thing, which had you know, which was a bit quicker and had fewer bugs to begin with and less, less of a regression impact. And then they would, that would get old and cumbersome and they would just keep pumping money into it. And then when they had no money or less money, fewer dollars, euros, uh, cent, whatever it may be, uh, they were left with this huge legacy of crap. And I think that building a bubble to sort out some of uh, bits of that legacy was always quite easy. Getting the truly getting the business to change their mindset or um, addressing some of the HR policies was always much harder. I must say at Royal Bank of Scotland, when I was there, because we were largely bailed out by the UK government, and there was a huge desire to change. Actually challenging some of those sacred things was much easier than say at Deutsche Bank. And at Deutsche Bank, it was, I don't think I think it's libelous to say that it was far harder to enact positive change in a deep and narrow way than, say, someone like RBS, where they really knew that they were in, that they were, had a problem which they had to fix. Yeah, so, yeah. But I, but I always found that unless unless other things changed around it, there was always a limit to how brilliant things could be. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, very recognizable. It, it does depend. Uh, I do I notice a bit of a difference between um, banks. So one, one uh, Société Générale, in this case, in my case, uh, was a, um, a, an actually quite positive experience. And this is due to um, some basic mantra that they introduced throughout the whole organization worldwide. Uh, so not a change actually happening through uh, like a top down or something. No, they kind of uh, simplify the message enormously. For example, by saying we want feature teams, we want the product ownership from the business side, uh, we want the teams to be aligned according to the business lines. Hmm. So these are the kind of like a quite simple three messages, and um, and um, and throughout the whole organization, this this was actually proved to be quite a good support to uh, have a, uh, let's say, uh, a healthy, uh, real change, but still in the bubbles indeed. So um, in Asia, in my case, and, um, um, and so where things prove, uh, yeah, they were, they proved to be after now a number of years, quite sustainable. But, uh, but looking back, this was a key difference that uh, throughout the organization, they had this simple message, which they kind of propagated something that I discovered and learned uh, through this experience. I think that's very, very good advice. And thinking back, when I look at RBS, sure, things were not great at times, but they did have an incredibly clear, they were good at making good, clear statements and sticking to it. They're sticking to it to the point of boredom or fatigue, but they stuck to it. And sometimes they perhaps they didn't make sense and sometimes they bred the wrong types of behaviours, but they did stick to it. It really did stick to it. And I think that there's a lot to be said. I mean, like you were saying earlier about alignment that comes from less or having that strong sense of purpose and allowing a certain degree of autonomy. I think meaningful messages which proliferate through the organization do allow people to align and create a big sense of purpose. Yeah. And that has to be something which people can actually see in their mind's eye as being achievable. Yep. And it's interesting what you were saying that for, in your situation, it was the Asia region where that worked. And then I'm guessing I can infer from that and in other regions, maybe it was slightly different. And what is it that works? Because they're big complex beasts, their messages that work so well in one geographic region just fall flat in another geographic region. And it's not, I, I don't, I, I think there is, yes, there's different in culture. I don't think it's different in cultures. It's, it's, the, it's the difference in everything in that organization at that time, which makes those messages not stick quite so well. Yeah, so the, uh, the that's an experience kind of like a, that the, I had of uh, within a, even the same organization, the the Paris side where the most people are, was a much more complex, uh, much more difficult to actually bring the the change, much more challenging simply because of the complexity. In Asia, was uh, was a big reason why it worked uh, uh, faster, 
and a more fundamental change is simply because the, the region is smaller and um, uh, simpler. Uh, so it's a, a fairly um, um, working, uh, fairly independent. Uh, I mean, um, they still need to completely align with the Paris stuff, but there was a decision making which was fairly independent. So the, uh, the second thing which um, may be interesting to mention is there's a widespread um, um, a misconception that uh, agile is something for a specific religion, uh, specific uh, cultures, and uh, so um, like a culture in uh, Europe uh, is uh, more compatible or something with uh, with um, especially nor nor northern uh, European countries would be more compatible with agility. But uh, this proves to be actually um, not the case. I mean, it plays out in a different way. But in a way, uh, agility thrives even more in Asia than in other parts of regions. And why? It's simply um, uh, the, the sense of, um, I don't know, um, of uh, taking risk, experimenting, trying things out. Uh, uh, so this proves to be very much aligned with the uh, agile way of working. And so that was uh, also what I, uh, that we benefit a lot from. I would echo that. I, I've never been to a geographic region that didn't enjoy or was capable of achieving a certain level of agility. The journey was different. People are different. The expectations are different. And yeah, there is a, some significant but interesting nuances. You know, I was, uh, I was really fortunate. I doubt he's listening. I, I doubt he'll listen to this. I'll forward it on to him though, but he, a gentleman who I worked with in India, in Chennai, I think it was, uh, gave me a wedding invitation, gave it to his wedding. And on his wedding invitation, he had his, uh, his job title and his wife's job title. And it was only at that point I realized just how significant it is in, in different cultures to, to say that this is what I, you know, this is my job title. He was really proud of what he did. That was a big thing. I'd never appreciated it to that point, the importance of it. And never mm. again did I ever unskillfully or on a whim decide that people shouldn't have certain job titles because it means it means a lot to people. It really does. Yep. And, you'd, and you'd never get that in the UK. One interesting no. thing, and I know we're kind of going off on all manner of tangents here, but I would be really interested to know, have you got any experience of working in banks or any organization where you have your permanent members of staff, people who are on payroll, who are on, on your, your monthly wage, monthly salary, um, versus contractors, people who are there getting paid on a day rate, who don't have to subscribe to the performance appraisals and all the other HRE type stuff. Have you ever noticed differences in those brackets of people and their ability to embrace going to where the work is in, say, a feature team? You mean like in Asia or um, in um, specifically or in general? Anywhere, anywhere. No. So um, I, um, I, the, 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 my first uh, uh, real less adoption, which wasn't even officially less, but it proved to be less, uh, is in the port of Rotterdam, and um, um, in the Netherlands, and um, there was um, more than half of the people were external, and so uh, they were uh, they were. Um, uh, contractors and um, and uh, and the rest was uh, internal people uh, on um, so they have a whole, whole HR stuff etc. So it was a remarkable situation. More than half of them was actually um, so. The, 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 my first reaction was, uh, "Ooh, that's going to be an issue because these people are basically don't really potentially feel connected to the product development group etc." And um, uh, so they uh, they uh, they have a reporting line very different. The objective is very different, etc. Now the remarkable thing happened is that, um, and it gave me also a lesson is that if you create a cool enough environment that you're working on something really cool, especially as a developer, your focus is generally just simply um, having a really good time and making something that you're proud of. And of course, you want to get paid properly, and uh, which is in Netherlands okay i guess and so um in that group nobody really was complaining about uh, salary um, i don't know uh, exact reason but it uh, they just didn't and uh, maybe because the the it was so cool to work on that product and um that um that that the people felt connected more to the product than the original company so you can imagine that 
Yeah, so pretty much everybody. And uh, so they felt like um, I'm going to work not for work for a, for my company, um, but I'm coming here to build this product, which is with other people there. So there is an association with the product and with uh, with the other teammates and teams team teams and uh, in the whole group uh, was a primary primary sense of a belonging. Yeah. It was quite remarkable to experience. That's really, it's really interesting. Yeah, that is interesting. The the difference between organizational purpose, product purpose, team purpose, the event, how much do they align or coalesce, the ability for people who aren't permanent permanent members of staff, let's say, who you'd think would have more skin in the game and would have bought into it more. The ability of good humans to get on board of it, even though they haven't got that. Because it's what I I found something very similar. That and to the extent what I would say that the people who haven't been permanent members of staff on payroll the people who have been day rate contractors specifically have been much more willing to learn new skills put the effort in to try something different find see something that's wrong and just go and learn about it and fix it because they, they never they've never had to worry about the career path about making sure they're sticking to their one thing to succeed or their bonus because they're getting paid decent money and they're in it to learn and if it's something they can believe in as well can be brilliant and that was just uh, I, I was really keen to hear your opinion on it because this is a uh, evolving i say hypotheses of mine i was keen yeah. to hear so, yeah for me after the after the um, port of Rotterdam, i came to asia in asia it's not common to have a contractors it's um, i'm um, used to now being the only contractor basically in uh, companies now uh, uh, in a, uh, yeah, seriously, in a Société Générale, for example, there are like a 500 IT people working. I was a single only one contractor, I believe. Maybe uh, there was somebody else for a few months for something else, but uh, uh, that, that was it. And uh, it's not common uh, right. because it's a different type of the world. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was, I was talking to uh, a very large UK-based bank uh, love, uh, a couple of weeks ago. They've got no contractors. You know, they're huge. They're a household name. Uh, not one contractor. I mentioned this yeah. and they told me that I couldn't mention it anymore. It's now a banned yeah. word. I was like, okay, I'll move on then. And I feel like I should move on because we've still got more questions to get through, Victor. And we're, making, okay, good. we're making slow progress, great conversation, but slow progress, which I think... Okay, okay. Really, the well, listeners you are, sorry? You just tell me, stop talking, Victor, and well, let's move to the next question, okay? Oh, yes, and you, <laughs> you just tell me, Ben, stop asking questions. I get lazy. I get curious. I want to like ask a question, learn a bit more, and then I feel like I want to contribute. So I'll shut up, go on to the next, uh, the next question, then we'll go for a break. So, Victor, did less choose you, or did you choose less? Um, I think uh, less chose me, I guess. Uh, it depends how I interpret that question. Maybe I interpret it not in a, in a good way. So what happened is that um, uh, what I just mentioned before, Port of Rotterdam case, we were simply experimenting based on uh, principles of Scrum, how to do Scrum with the many teams. And, uh, and, and that happened to be the exactly same principles, uh, understanding of Scrum as, uh, as it is also in less. So uh, then um, what happened is that I ended up with uh, uh, implementing less together with a bunch of other people through experimentation. And then I ended up in Asia and I came across BUS. And, um, and, um, um, and I think uh, BUS uh, saw my, uh, um, my, my, uh, my talk uh, in a conference. And um, I think it's in, in Singapore. And, uh, and then he said, um, well, um, um, what you, uh, you do you want to be a less trainer because it seems like uh, what i talk about and what i explain and the way of thinking and looking at stuff it's uh, an already done basically less adoption and um, so would you like to be that and i said okay let's work on that so that's how it ended up actually and um, i never actually kind of like i looked up i never even read the bus books so i was doing less adoption without knowing anything about bus or his books the funny part is that I remember working, I used to work at Xebia 
uh, before all of this. Sorry to interrupt you. So, the, and I was um, um, and, uh, in Exibia, is now a really big Dutch, like uh, the major player in this whole space. And um, so at that time, it was uh, like a, a 16 people, one six, okay? So there was a, like a really small. And we had this um, in the office, uh, like a very small building, and um, it's actually just a larger house. And then we have uh, this uh, library. And in the library, I remember seeing those books, but I never bothered to pick them up and read them. So you could just take those books and read them. And so I just didn't bother to do that. But I do remember those books. So it's kind of a funny. Yeah. It's a common pattern that people are successful using Scrum. And not even moderately successful, I would say. I would say really successful using Scrum. And then they happened across one of the books or the Less.Works website for those trainers that maybe came a little bit after you and I, because I know that they... When you became a trainer, there was no less dot works. And I know that when I became a trainer, there was no less dot works. I remember looking at the early logos for less, and the one that I preferred didn't get chosen. But it was kind of complex. It was a very complex logo. But it's true. I think that to make Scrum work brilliantly well, you tend to end up doing a lot of what less suggests. And in that respect, I think lots of people do end up falling into less rather than explicitly choosing it. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about it. Yeah. Um, and maybe just to add to that, um, it's, uh, I do notice there is also quite a lot of people who do not end up with less when doing Scrum. And I wondered for a long time how this uh, happened to be. And, um, and then I noticed there is a something uh, underneath the understanding of Scrum, which is fun, can be almost opposite to each other. And um, um, so, uh, in a in a Scrum community in general, there, there seems to be. Um, um, and, and so this is also important for listeners to understand. There is a there is a fundamental difference in how Scrum is being perceived. One is um, about uh, making development go faster. Okay, so uh, uh, delivering stuff faster, and uh, and uh, so it's kind of like a seeing things uh, uh, as it is in uh, in Toyota. Uh, meaning it's a factory, okay? So you need to produce cars, and you and uh, you measure stuff, and you want to deliver more and more. And so you adopt Scrum to do that. Uh, so um, um, uh, so I kind of uh, uh, explain a little bit of this way of thinking about it. So you see it more or less kind of like a as a delivering stuff faster, basically, and um, um, and uh, hence the velocity and the story points, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the um, um, and there's a whole range of other practices which are related to that. And then there is a completely, it's a fundamentally different way of looking at things, not to actually do stuff faster. Uh, Scrum, not meant to be uh, uh, something to actually do things, uh, deliver st stuff faster. Uh, it's not an objective at all. It's, a, it's a actually, the objective is to learn. And um, so it's about learning. And um, uh, uh, not trying to deliver a lot. And uh, deliver a lot is a kind of like, it's not simply not objective. They may or may not happen, but it's just not an objective. These are quite opposing uh, two different uh, objectives, which um, uh, which I notice more and more in the community. Uh, and um, there's a lots of debates and discussion where I notice when people have these opposite views that the debate tends to go really, uh, uh, can get heated yeah. up. And I wonder if some of the heated, the heat of the debates is down to people's inability to hold an opinion loosely or whether both sides are right. I don't know. I mean, I've really, I've evolved my thinking over the months and years. Uh, Bar said something to me at the beginning of the year that you know, less or you know, scrum is a framework for creating great teams. And that was a bit of a light bulb moment for me. I thought, okay, now I, that adds a new perspective for me. I can see that because then that helps with the learning aspect. It isn't talking about speed but also a part of this was to outmaneuver the competition and you don't always know what decisions are the right decisions to make well when do we ever know what are the right product decisions to make there's always an element of a gamble there so you know, being able to get something out to, to have that gamble quickly is really important but then yeah. but there is you know i think it would i think it is naive to say that going it's naive to say that going fast is good, but it's also naive to say that going fast isn't something that we should aim for. 
if you know what I mean, because there's so much more to it. Like we want to go fast, but like the Agile Manifesto says, we want to maximize the amount of work not done. So we want to go fast doing the right things. Objectively, that may be slower than going fast doing the wrong things. What would we prefer? Yeah, exactly. So um, I found, um, uh, especially in the context of organization design and helping organization when they, uh, in the beginning, as you know, uh, in the less adoptions, uh, we try to establish some mutual agreement what organization wants to achieve. And uh, then we as a less trainers, coaches help them uh, achieve that. And uh, I found it really, really useful to um, to understand this thinking behind it. So this this fundamental idea behind it, how the mental models, these fundamental mental models of uh, how people look at product development. And um, so it's uh, exactly as you explained, it's not a matter of um, right or wrong. It's a matter of, a, uh, I found it the most useful aspect of it, understanding that there are different mental models. They are competing with each other. and uh, uh, But they don't need to compete with each other, as you explained, uh, depending on how it's being explained. So indeed, if you um, do not deliver something fast enough, you're not going to get a feedback. And I sometimes don't use word fast in order to ex emphasize the difference. I then I say sooner. So you need to deliver something soon enough. So fast implies that you need to deliver a lot in a short period of time. So just to kind of uh, explain the difference so that people understand what exactly am I trying to achieve essentially. And so this proves to be um, uh, uh, this lack of uh, discussion on that level. Um, and especially with the management organization is um, is really widespread. Uh, so the whole organizations are adopting agile way of working without really having a discussion of on this level. And this this is actually uh, can be quite harmful because you are trying to uh, achieve certain objective and you are not getting it uh, simply because of misunderstanding. Reminds me, I had the conversation I had with Rowan Bunning a number of months ago, and he was saying how important it is to get people aligning on the why of what you're trying to achieve, understanding the what and the how, and at least getting some shared understanding of that. And your yeah. your choice of the word soon is brilliant. It reminded me of somebody that I met, I met a few times back in the day, uh, a guy called John Smart, who wrote a book called, I'm looking ahead to my left to see it, Better Value Sooner, Safer, Happier. And I like the idea of sooner. And, and I like the idea that this isn't about right or wrong. It's about, it can be both, but it's holding that, it's holding the tension between these things. And that's what we're, that's what organizations seem to struggle with. You know, people are looking for binary answers on some of these things when actually it's about holding things in tension and trying to get a balance of these things over time. So have teams that learn and get stuff out sooner and focus on high quality and focus on reducing the proximity between the teams and the customers. And getting alignment at the beginning is so critical to that. So Victor, Thank you very much. So much, so much useful information. Almost too much for my brain to cope with right now. So we're going to go for a break. When we get back from the break, I'm going to have a fresh mind. I'm going to go and wash it out. Bit of a scrub, pop it back in. And we are going to be finding out, Victor, what's the one thing about less that you love more than anything else? So stay with us. We'll be back in a few moments where we'll find out what it is that Victor loves the most about less. We'll see you in a moment. <coughs> oh, cool. We won't actually, I won't actually go wash my brain. I'm just trying to make the podcast interesting for people. <laughs> right. Um, are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Okay. And welcome back, everyone. Lovely to see that you stuck with us. I hope you enjoyed those short messages. We put them in the middle so that you listen. I hope it works. If it doesn't work, let me know. And I'll put them at the beginning or at the end. Let's see. I'll experiment. But thank you for coming back. It's appreciated. My brain is clean. Victor is refreshed. I saw him refreshing himself. Which is why? Just finishing it's finished off. Finished yeah. yeah. That's the beauty of these, uh, doing, recording these shows is that I, I get to talk to you. You're at the end of your day and I'm looking at the clock, wondering, well, I'm going to go have my lunch after this. And you yeah, it's good that you mentioned that indeed. Yeah. Otherwise, people are going to think, what the heck are you? Yeah, and you're, anyway. you're firmly in the evening. You are yep. firmly, yeah. Anyway, so Victor, what's the one thing above all others about less that you love? 
Um, it's uh, the um, the the way the f the the framework is positioned. Then it that it it's that it doesn't stand in the way of um, um, of achieving the change. So you can literally in adopt less without really talking about less. That sounds weird, but so you can um, you basically um, less is uh, uh, comprised in such a way. And the teaching in such a way is that emphasis is on a learning and teaching and not on a framework as a thing. And um, um, so um, this means that it, uh, it is, it's not standing in a way of focusing on stuff which really matters, matters such as, for example, self-management and um, uh, the notion of self-management. And this, this one aspect I, um, is... Um, probably the most satisfying aspect in retrospect after less adoptions. And why is that? Because individuals, not necessarily organizations, but individuals themselves uh, uh, give you feedback later on and say, uh, this uh, changed fundamentally how I work and how I look at the work in a positive way. It's, uh, it makes product development more fun, more satisfying, more motivating. And um, I get to contribute, uh, I get to participate, I get to do something which makes sense, which is useful. And if something is not useful, I can do something about it. So, um, 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 yeah, hearing this kind of um, thank yous and, 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 and feedback uh, is, um, is the single most motivating aspect of my work. Yeah. Building on that then, and it's lovely to hear that you get such great feedback. I think it, it is one of the things that, that drives us in what we do. And it's well-deserved because you're a great guy, Victor. So thinking about that feedback that you get, is there one particular less adoption or depending on how you want to word it, time where less has been used to some extent that you class as your favourite? Oh, one of okay. My favorite less adoption. Um, well, that's actually considering the previous question. It's interesting. The my favorite one is uh, the 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 Port of Rotterdam one, which I mentioned also before, and the first one. And after that, to be honest, I never encountered a situation which uh, comes even close on a level of uh, agility and, and in all kinds of aspects. And, uh, and the key differentiating factor is the technical excellence, the level of technical excellence that these people have uh, embraced. And so the whole less aspect of it, organizational aspect of it, is that we set uh, uh, the environment, it, it was set up so, so successful that it gave space for the people to start to uh, truly own their own product development the way they work. And this made... Um, this created a, a setting within which people um, uh, create this, uh, a huge buzz and uh, became part of a DNA of the people to talk about the technical excellence and to adopt all kinds of practices. And that can kind of kept going. And so most of energy was spent on that. And that, that's, that's uh, for me, the favorite one. It was just simply really fun to be part of that. And, um, but then there is a second uh, aspect of it, which I just mentioned in your previous question, is uh, what makes it uh, satisfying. I mean, this was one less adoption is uh, quite some time ago. After that, all other less adoptions, to be honest, uh, they, uh, they were not uh, as successful as, um, as the one in the Port of Rotterdam in a sense of organizationally. I mean, the sense of quality and everything. Uh, that one was really astonishing as uh, well, in, and that's proven in every single aspect. Uh, even the organization themselves, they were enormously surprised how well it worked. Uh, after that, uh, I never really encountered that level of a, of a difference. I mean, things from organizational point improve quite quite a bit, and uh, and the organization is quite happy. But then I always compare it to the first one, and it doesn't come even close. Okay, so the, but then I uh, noticed that uh, individuals themselves they are more uh, they are thankful. They see uh, themselves, they experience themselves difference. Uh, how it was before and how it is now. And so this difference, um, um, so uh, I noticed, uh, for example, in Société Générale, the, uh, there was a group of uh, market access teams. And uh, so um, it's about uh, 30, 40 people, something like that, 30 people, I think. And they uh, formed the feature teams and they are still working together. And they, um, 
there was a very low turnover, something which is quite remarkable in Hong Kong. Huh? Hong Kong still today, after now seven years, I think. And uh, in Hong Kong, the turnover is uh, very high compared to like European uh, countries and companies. And, uh, and in this case, it was uh, lowered a lot and um, uh, clearly very successful. And uh, but the, the, there is a clear business success. Uh, but to be honest, the, the, the real satisfaction is from uh, people being uh, much happier in the work and they're being proud of that. And so that, this is something I noticed much more in Asia uh, than I uh, than I've seen in uh, in Netherlands, for example. And the port of Rotterdam case study, which is on the less we less website, and I'll put a link to it in the show notes. That was the one you did before you found less as less as a as a thing. Is that right? Yeah, correct. So yeah. playing devil's advocate, has it been finding less that has made you less successful in your? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I. Uh, it was. Um... The um, it's uh, the less adoption, successful less adoption is uh, is not because of me. I'm just a one factor. Uh, there are so many factors which play a role, and um, and the factors in uh, in Port of Rotterdam, they were um, uh, they were just simply combination of all kinds of things. And uh, one thing which definitely didn't contribute that much is my level of experience of how to do this kind of a stuff. I was just trying things out. I didn't really know that well what I'm doing. So uh, I, I knew Scrum. I knew how to do product development in a, from technical aspects, but how to actually organize a bunch of teams in a, in a certain way, we, we were just trying out. We didn't know if it were going to work, experimenting a lot. And so I, um, the new situations uh, were just simply much more complex. And uh, so larger companies, lots of bureaucracy, uh, all kinds of other things. And uh, so that makes it much, much harder to make a difference. Yeah. So at Port of Rotterdam, were you faced with any challenges in getting technical excellence prioritized? Because I know that's something which people will, will always say. There's always questions about how do I get technical debt prioritized? How do we go slower because we're going to do this practice, even though we know it will go quicker in the end, but how do we make the case for wanting to do this work now or wanting to re, re slowly evolve the architecture to make it more amenable to certain technologies or practices? Did you have struggles in getting that prioritized? Or maybe the better question is, how did you get it prioritized? Um, so we... Yeah, that's a good question. I think uh, there was already existing in the, having a few senior developers who happened to be quite passionate about their profession and also uh, very open to um, to be better as a product developers. And we, we had a number of those, I think four or five, something like that. And uh, one of them, uh, for Roy Farain, for example, he is now pretty much famous in Java community. He's uh, giving talks everywhere. And uh, so he, this, this, uh, these people, they were really passionate about uh, making sure that they're doing better and better and better and better. And so I think that that was the, the, the main driver. And so when I, when I would talk about stuff like, uh, Typically, one of the major subjects that I talked about is how to uh, deal with architecture in a continuous way so uh, that you continuously re-architect everything. So um, you're constantly re uh, uh, reassessing the architecture that you have. So it becomes, uh, as we talk about in less, more uh, growing something instead of uh, just uh, having a picture and stuff. So that was uh, that was mine, kind of like a main uh, mantra that I that I was doing, and that. But there was already fruitful uh, ground for that because we have these people who are very much concerned and feel responsible for the architecture. Now they just need uh, some. Uh, uh, they need facilitation. They need to be taught how to actually deal with that, and so they um, um, that worked out, and uh, that that how it, how it happened. Uh, when I compare to the, the other situations, other companies, it's uh, it's much harder because uh, software engineers, unfortunately, have been educated that the software engineering is about writing code. And that's very, very unfortunate. Yeah. Also, for some 
software engineering is a path to becoming a manager. Ah, uh, yeah, that's even <laughs> worse. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you, Victor. Thank you. Yeah, again, really useful information, and I, I did want to kind of pick up on that because it is a com it's such a common problem getting the right focus on technical excellence. And what you were saying about having those few people, you had fertile ground. You had some great people who wanted to make this happen. I think that when I've been in similar situations, you've seen that those people, because they are proven and they are good and people know that they are, have the organization's best interest in mind, they get a lot of respect and they get a lot of time and, and what they're saying gets listened to and they, they act as great role models. And you can't, can't underestimate the power of Fantastic. So thank yep. you, Vang. Thank you, Victor. Um, as I said, the link to those uh, to that case study, Port of Rotterdam, will be in the show notes. Now, the last less focused question that I want to ask you is, if you could change one thing about less, and I mean less in the, the overloaded meaning of the term, framework, guides, experiments, the whole, the whole shebang, if you could change one mm -hmm. thing, what would that one thing be? Uh, disconnect from the Scrum Guide and Scrum Rules and uh, make this uh, reduced number of rules uh, because there is an implicit rule in LS that you follow the Scrum Guide and um, uh, now it's already a bit uh, um, unclear which Scrum Guide because it clearly doesn't follow the new one. Yeah, so well, it, it's, it's a good it, one. We follow, we follow the good one, Victor, not the, not the broken one, isn't it? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> so the, so this, uh, uh, but I would go further if you ask me. So uh, I would um, um, let go of, uh, for example, I noticed uh, uh, lots of teams which don't even do daily Scrum, for example, but they do more programming all day. Bloody hell, I would always say do more programming instead of daily Scrum. Uh, so um, uh, if uh, teams prefer to do that, uh, so the, from my experience. And so the, uh, they, they quite often introduce all kinds of XP practices instead of... Um, I don't know. So the and a sprint backlog. Uh, then uh, there's uh, so many creative ways of doing that. And uh, so yeah, this kind of a thing. And so the the, the you kind of like um, the, the the Scrum rules are um, not really helpful to be honest. It doesn't really contribute that much. And uh, so I I would uh, reduce that somehow. I don't know how far. So certain things uh, should be uh, kept, but. Um, not not be so uh, focused on a, on a scrum rules and scrum scrum guide yeah. yeah well it's interesting isn't it and i might just show myself up here but the scrum values which i think uh i like the scrum values i have to, yeah. I have to admit why they aren't more front and center in less because the rules are yeah you know, we have a lot of rules and honestly the only people i've ever seen sit down and go through the less rules have been people who are shepherding or in some way feel responsible for less adoption and just wondering where to focus next. I've never seen a team sit down willingly and be oh, I know what we'll do. So we're gonna we're gonna not do we're not gonna mob this afternoon. We're gonna sit down and we're gonna audit ourselves against the less rules. But I don't think anyone ever said that ever, did they? Yeah, that's true. That's true. So that uh, that helps a lot already. So it's not really in that sense if uh, if uh, less would be reduced like that, it would uh, make a huge difference or something because it's not not a big issue anyway yeah, that's true no i no, i i hear what you're saying around the less rules and then with the scrum guide changing as well i think it's a solid answer i think it's a solid answer i'm all yeah. for another, removing stuff yeah. Yeah, yeah another thing is the scrum master thing so the the the, the term itself is horrible and um, um so um but then um the, what I notice is also is that um, uh, the, the the industry has uh, completely destroyed uh, the the role uh, because there is uh, almost everybody seems to think it's uh, about uh, some kind of a process owner and if it's truly horrible and it's a Jira administrator so it's kind of like a, the term is so so yeah destroyed it's the role is so destroyed in industry that it become very unclear so I would. Um, uh, have something more generic. Uh, people who are basically helping teaching teams um, in uh, uh, in continuous improvement, They're assisting teams in continuous improvement, and so they can do that also, especially from a technical point of view, which is the most lacking part. I agree. I think agile coach as a industry 
agile coaching as an industry is sending the profession of agile coach just into the same into the same yes. pit of ambiguity and misinformation as as the role of scrum masters ended up in in my exactly. mind i i've been learning a lot about uh team coaching particularly professional team coaching the last three four months i've got another six months of learning ahead of me and it's been utterly mind-blowing learning about the the state of professional team coaching and how it's in that they the people who have written some of the best books on it so I'll, i've got a book here building building performing top performing teams um it's an interesting book and the authors are my lecturers at, at university and they've done a huge amount of research into team coaching and that's really good it's fascinating because when you read it, you're like, oh, well, this is kind of what agile coaching and actually this is kind of what being a scrum master was all about. And we've got on the agile world and we've never, there's never been enough done. I think I see agile did a good job of their syllabus, but it's too, for our agile coaching, but it's too individual focused. And I think the word scrum master, I think there's a phrase ignoring people's opinions on whether or not it's a, a good label or not it, it, just, it has become meaningless as a role and i think that there is so yeah. much value to be had from real team coaching and i wish that we could yep. just say scrum masters and agile coaches you're all the same because you've all ended up at the same level anyway from what i can see let's just embrace it and say right we're agile team coaches and let's just focus on teams and teams of teams and to say that the organization is a big group and let's just focus our coaching efforts rather than trying to, you know, like I say, be uh, an owner of a process. Because I've seen people with the role of Scrum Master be brilliant, absolutely brilliant, and not do anything like Scrum Mastery. Because what that team at that point needed was someone to take a, a, a leadership role because they all figured that some, they were all waiting for someone else to do it. So this person, they come in, they take a bit of a leadership role, they spur the right things, and then they step away, and that team are rolling, and they're doing stuff. They're in a position where they can meaningfully be coached. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I actually like it. So I haven't uh, thought about that term and uh, this kind of a way of looking. Uh, but the, in, I mean, the specifically agile team coaching. So in my mind, I was more thinking like, uh, didn't thought much about it, and more kind of like a, in, a, in a generic sense, is that... Um, uh, there, there, there has to be in any kind of a sensible continuous improvement people around the surrounding teams which are teaching and helping teams to continuously improve so from that point of view but it very much aligns with uh, completely with what you describe also so with in, your description is a bit more precise indeed yeah so victor thank you very much for your time your answers your question or questions to me i've appreciated it is there anything that you would like to share with our listeners before you depart for the day? Perhaps um, somewhere that they can find you if they did want to talk to you about anything might be a nice start. Uh, LinkedIn is fine, I guess. I'm mostly active there. And um, uh, yeah, LinkedIn is the best uh, part. I guess uh, you, you're going to share the link or something. Absolutely. So, I'll uh, put your LinkedIn profile into the, the the link to it in the show notes so people can, can bug you directly. Okay, good, good. And um, besides that, I very much enjoyed uh, uh, the um, the conversation. It's really lovely. I, indeed, and the same feeling. I could keep t talking to you for hours and, uh, and uh, kind of... At, and, um, the the how they say challenge each other's ideas and build upon the further on that or, or maybe disagree on some of them that would be really lovely next time we meet victor in person i will purposely disagree with something that you say sure. just to make it interesting more interesting i'm not saying this wasn't interesting i suppose that we will be seeing each other at the less conference in september are you going to be making it to that I uh, hope so. That depends very much on uh, on our quarantine rules, which is now 21 days in uh, Hong Kong. Uh, so that sucks a lot. So if uh, that changes, then I'm going to come. Yeah. So for transparency, you know, Victor and I are recording this at the very end of February. And by the time you're listening to it, it's a few months later. So hopefully, Victor, you will, you'll be free of quarantine rules. And yeah, yes. we, can get, we can get to spend some time together at the LESS conference where we can disagree on something publicly. Just, 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 good. Yeah, just for the show of it, <laughs> Victor. Yeah. Uh, Victor, do you offer public less courses? 
not uh, currently. I'm almost entirely focusing now on uh, coaching and adoptions in uh, companies internally. So, but uh, my in the future it might change. By the time that you publish this, I might have them. Nice. Well, if they are, I'll make sure that I'll pop a link to them in the show notes. You know, I want to want to make sure people want to get more victor in their lives and also want to get a nice little blue badge or whatever color badge was being offered then we'll make sure that people can find you victor thank you so much it's been a brilliant conversation everybody thank you very much for listening or watching if you are watching the video of this we look forward to meeting you all again in the next episode of the less trainer interview i'm not sure who that will be i will find out and we'll let you know so victor thank you very much everyone that's watched or listened thank you very much and we will see you all again soon stay safe thank you